most food crops are contaminated with fungal mycotoxins. Watch the video to find out how much of a problem this may be. In France, exposure to dietary contaminants was compared between vegetarians and meat eaters, and the results showed that exposures to persistent organic pollutants like PCBs and dioxins was dramatically lower among those eating more plant-based due to the non-consumption of foods of animal origins. Though they did have higher estimated exposure to some mycotoxins, fungal toxins present in moldy food. Now, there are lots of types of mold on the planet, and the vast majority are harmless. But over the last several years, certain mold toxins, such as aflatoxin and ochratoxin, have been popping up in breakfast cereals. Hundreds of samples were taken off store shelves, and about half were contaminated with ochratoxin, for example. But those were store shelves in Pakistan, and Pakistan has a subtropical climate with monsoons and flash floods, uh, leading to fungal propagation. But then, Similar results have popped up in Europe, Serbia, Spain, Portugal. Then mycotoxins were discovered in breakfast cereals in Canada. What about breakfast cereals in the United States? 144 samples were collected, and similar to other countries, about half were found to contain ochratoxin, but only about 7% exceeded the maximum limit established by the European Commission. What is the significance of the finding of ochratoxin in breakfast cereals from the United States? This was the largest study to date, including nearly 500 samples of cereal off store shelves across the U.S. Overall detection rates were about 40%, and although only 16 violated the European standards, all of the cereals with ochratoxin were oat-based, making about 1 in 13 of the oat-based breakfast cereal samples tested being contaminated. Ochratoxin has become increasingly regulated by many countries to minimize chronic exposure. Here are the current regulations for mycotoxins in cereal-based baby foods worldwide, for example. Some countries are very strict, like in the European Union. Other countries, less so, and one country in particular has no standards at all. Ochratoxin is not currently regulated at all in the United States. What if you stick to organic products? One might expect them to actually be worse, owing to the fact that fungicides are not allowed in organic production. However, mycotoxin concentrations are usually similar or even reduced in organic compared to conventional products. For example, in one of the breakfast cereal studies, researchers found similar contamination, and the same was found for infant foods. It cannot be concluded that one is better than the other from a mycotoxin perspective. Despite no use of fungicides, organic systems appear generally able to maintain maintain mycotoxin contamination at low levels. But how much is that saying, given how widespread it is? How concerned should we be about the public health effects from long-term exposure of this potent mycotoxin? I mean, if you look at blood samples taken from populations going back decades, sometimes 100% of people turned out positive for ochratoxin circulating in their bloodstream. In some sense, they are unavoidable contaminants of food, since the detection of mycotoxins is not only easy and they can remain hidden. And once foods have become contaminated, mycotoxins aren't destroyed by cooking. So are there some foods we should simply try to avoid due to higher risk of contamination? That that's exactly the question I'm going to address next. Oats can be thought of as uniquely nutritious, and one route they improve human health is by providing prebiotics that increase the growth of beneficial gut microbiota. Of course, there are oats, and then there are oats, ranging from steel-cut oats to even better intact oat groats, their form before being cut, all the way down to highly processed cereals such as Honey Nut Cheerios. Rolling crushes the grain, which may disrupt cell walls and damage starch granules, making them more available for digestion, which is bad since we want the starch to make it all the way down to our colon to feed our good gut bacteria, and grinding into oat flour to make breakfast cereals is even worse. If you compare the blood sugar and insulin responses, you can see significantly lower spikes with the more intact steel-cut oats. OK, but what about ochratoxin? The leading source of dietary exposure of this mold contaminant, uh, but they aren't the only source. Uh, there's a worldwide contamination of food crops with mycotoxins, with some experts throwing around estimates as high as 25% of the world's crops. Uh, that statistic is attributed to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, but it turns out that stat is bogus. It's not 25%. 
Instead, it may be more like 60 to 80 percent. The high occurrence is likely explained by a combination of the improved sensitivity of testing methods as well as the impact of climate change. Spices have been found to have some of the highest concentrations of mycotoxins, but because they're ingested in such small quantities, they aren't considered to be a significant source. We can certainly do our part to minimize risk, though. It is also the consumer's responsibility to keep spices dry after opening sealed containers or packages. What about dried herbs? Mycotoxins in plant-based dietary supplements. The highest mycotoxin concentrations were found in milk thistle-based supplements. It turns out wet and humid weather is needed during milk thistle harvest, which evidently is why they end up being so moldy. Considering the fact that milk thistle preparations are mainly used by people who suffer from liver disease, such high intake of compounds toxic to the liver may present some concern. Wine, sourced from the United States, also appears to have particularly high levels. In fact, the single highest level found to date around the world is in American wine. But there is contamination in wine in general. In fact, some suggest that's why we see such consistent levels in people's blood, perhaps because lots of people are regular wine drinkers. Ochre toxin is said to be a kidney toxin with immunosuppressive birth defect causing carcinogenic properties. Uh, so what about ochre toxin decontamination, removing the toxin in wine? Uh, now ideally we'd try to prevent the contamination in the first place, but since this isn't always practical, there is increased focus on finding effective methods of detoxification of mycotoxins already present in foods, and that's where yeast comes in as a promising solution, because the mycotoxins bind to the yeast cell wall. The thought is that you could strain out the yeast, but another approach would be to eat something like nutritional yeast to prevent the absorption. It works in chickens. Give yeast along with aflatoxin, another mycotoxin, and you diminish the severity of the resulting disease. But using something like nutritional yeast as a binder depends on the stability of the yeast mycotoxin bond throughout the digestive tract. Uh, we know yeast can remove ochratoxin in foods, but we didn't have a clue if it would work in the gut until 2016. Yeast was found to bind up to 44% of the ochratoxin, but in actuality it was probably closer to only about a third since some of the bindings weren't stable. So if you're trying to stay under the maximum daily intake and you drink a single glass of wine, even if your bar snack is popcorn seasoned with nutritional yeast, you'd still probably exceed the tolerable intake. But what does that mean? How bad is this stuff? We'll find out next.